Thanks everybody for joining us today for what I think is the fourth of our events for the City Entrepreneur Network, which is part of uh, City University, um, CAS Business School. And today's event is going to be all about finding product market fit, uh, developing your MVP, your minimum viable product. And we've got an incredible lineup of, of speakers, everybody from, um, we've got Sahabe, who's a founder, we've got Caitlin, who uh, is a marketer, we've got uh, Lukash, who is a product specialist. So we're going to be able to cover all these different areas during the panel. And um, we'll spend about 30, 35 minutes with uh, panelist questions. And then we're going to hand it over to audience questions. And we always run out of time for those. So if you've got a burning question, like make sure you put it in the chat. Uh, Charles is going to be like going through those and, and trying to bring up as, as many as we can. And uh, obviously, if, if you want to watch this again, it's being recorded, we'll put it on, uh, on YouTube later so you can go back through and, and catch up on anything. And uh, we will uh, have Ono leading all of the questions, um, the majority of the questions uh, in, the, in the middle of it. But I think with that, maybe we will just start with intros from uh, so hey, Caitlin and Lukash. So, who wants to who wants to take it away? Yeah, I don't mind going first. Um, hi, I'm Sahib. Um, so I'm the founder of Unfacts. Um, I come from a banking finance background. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant by profession, and I recently went full time on my startup. Um, so we're focusing on supporting small businesses with insights that help them better understand what their customers want. Uh, typically in the UK, what you find is about 60-70% of small businesses fail within the first five years uh, and the lack of market understanding is one of the key reasons for that. So we're trying to, um, I guess, approach this in a different way, which hasn't been done before entirely, um, by providing them with insights that are specific to their business that helps them better understand what their customers want, what's happening in the market uh, and how things are moving so they can constantly keep on top of uh, what's happening and make better decisions ideally. Uh, I can go. Uh, my name's Caitlin. I am based in New York City. I've been here. Uh, I've been kind of in the fashion industry for the past 15 years. I formerly was the COO of a retail brand here in the States called Rowing Blazers. Uh, we actually do pretty well in the UK too, so you might have heard of us. Uh, and currently I am the founder uh, and managing partner of 56NY, which is a e-com and digital uh, marketing agency here in New York. Uh, hi guys, thanks for uh, having me. Lucas, uh, based in Dubai currently, working product in, uh, in Swivel, which is a mass transportation startup. Before that, I also spent some time in product in other, other startups that you might have heard about. A uh, couple of years in, in Jumia, which is the first e-commerce platform for Africa. And a couple of years in Karim, which got recently purchased by, by Uber. And yeah, I was mostly supporting development of, of digital products in, in those companies. So I hope guys, uh, yeah, I'll be able to contribute with, uh, with the team. I have no doubt you will, uh, as will everybody. So with that, let's let's kick things off straight away. I'm going to hand it over to Ono to start with the questions. Thanks, Tori. Um, yes, so we're going to start with some uh, questions mainly focused on research and ideation of the, um, of the market and to understand um, or better understand the market. Um, so the journey from turning to an idea into a hypothesis and then to put it to test. Um, basically, there, there is this one step that you have to really do the research. And then when you do it, you have to analyze the market and put it into your hypothesis and then develop it into, a, well, into the product. And I have recently read an article, or we have re recently read an article that there are many dead apps out there. 
and you mostly due to lack of market product fit. So how do you really identify what's your target market and the segment that you're trying to serve? And um, how do you do best the desk research on this? Um, I, I can take this. Um, so um, yeah, so it, it's an interesting one, um, turning an idea into uh, a business. And I think it usually comes down to speaking to you to, to the user a lot. I don't. It, it, I don't think it's that complicated. Sometimes people do overcomplicate it with what kind of technology they want, or what features they want, or um, what kind of UI they're looking for. But I think at the core, uh, it is about kind of talking to the user as many users as possible, understanding what they want, what they're looking for, and what problem you're solving. Um, so either your app or your web platform or your startup uh, will have to either um, provide some value to the user, um, which they need on an ongoing basis, uh, or solve a problem for them. Um, and I think if it does one of one of the two things, um, then potentially the user will keep coming back and keep using it. Um, so you've got new apps like Clubhouse recently, um, which don't necessarily kind of provide a solution to a problem. No one had a problem before, but it's actually providing a lot of value in terms of speaking to people um, and connecting with a new audience. So um, yeah, so I think that, that that's quite important. Um, speak, uh, and a, a good book that I think is quite important when speaking to users is the Mom Test. Um, so. I think when you're speaking to users, um, quite a lot of new time founders can uh, end up asking the wrong questions and accidentally validating um, <laughs> the wrong problem um, or uh, getting some biased results. So it's important to ask the right questions, understand the challenge and understand their willingness to pay uh, to solve that challenge. Um, and I think, I think it's a good place from there to move on to creating a solution. Lucas, do you want to go? <laughs> right, go, go, Katie. No, wait. Uh, no, I tend to agree with Sohab. Um, I, I think a lot of founders that I work with tend to have this idea of who they want their target market audience to be, and they pigeonhole themselves when they'll run any sort of digital advertising or when they go to market. And I think it's really important from the beginning to cast as wide of a net as possible and understand who your user is going to be, then do your focus groups and understand, okay, who's actually integrating with my, my product and using it and finding value there um, and sort of developing that further. Whenever I, I work with anyone who's launching a business, um, I, I sort of don't want to limit, oh, let's target only 25 to 40 year olds, right? Because there's going to be some fringe use cases and who knows, those could be some of your fastest growing markets. Yeah, it's, I, I obviously fully agree with, with you guys. I just want to add to this that when, when sometimes when you, when you have a big idea like around it, like you kind of spotted some, some big uh, opportunity or problem or underserved need that you want to solve. Uh, I've, I see that people tend also to, to get lost in entire solution in this product mindset, thinking that, hey, we get super, super great idea. Like, hey, let's, you know, let's, uh, let's launch it. It is going to work super well. But we miss like the what is really needed at this stage is this kind of first principle thinking when you're actually able to divide all your problem into set of hypotheses and understand that those are actually assumptions and which of them are the most risky that you can test, right? So I mean there is like example let's say there is given I think everywhere as as this hypothesis like the guy that was supposed to uh, that founded Zappos was supposed to sell shoes online. No one ever done it before. So how can you even know that people can buy shoe online? Because you don't know if they're gonna try it on or not. How can it work? So someone told him, hey, like no one, no one's gonna buy shoes online, right? So the guy just set it up and they didn't have any ops and whoever like placed the order, they were just delivering those shoes. But the guy know that actually people can buy shoes online by the size, right? Same like people with Airbnb, like they, they basically, in investors told them that no one's gonna sleep at place of other person because it's dangerous, right? So that was this big market assumption that they got. They believed it can work and they, they tested it gradually. But it's that the critical part is to spot this one uh, or couple hypothesis that you're really not able to prove in, in like in any other way. And that's where your research should be focused on. 
that's uh, I think that's that's how many people approach it, and I think those startups are pretty successful. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe directly to that, the next question would be, um, yeah, leading towards the segmentation of the market and the customer personas. So when and where to begin the market research and um, how to identify your target market? Um, yeah, I think that's a burning question to many. I can start. Um, you know, when is always interesting because it's gonna be different for everyone, right? I think while I was at Gilt, it wasn't until year four or five that they really took a look at their personas and started defining what those personas would be for people. Um, whereas at Rowing Blazers, for example, that was something from day one I was really interested in diving into and seeing how we can split it out and break it up. Um, your question was when and then how to define them. I, that was the question, right? Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's almost like a which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Like, do you want to let your data drive who your personas are, or do you want your personas to then let you drive your strategies and who you're going to go after? Um, I've always found that having sort of a base core kind of what Soha was talking about before, understanding who your user is, and then working directly with them and figuring out what they're into, what they like, where else they're shopping, what else they're interested in online, and building off of that rather than just pigeonholing yourself into, okay, well, I need my persona to be this type of person, so I'm only going to go after this market or advertise in these channels because that's where they are. You could be completely um, sort of ignoring an untapped market if you really just let your, I don't want to say let your intuition guide you, but um, if you're not sort of as open as possible to exploring all the different options. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Um, but I think at the same time, it is quite important to have well-defined personas because um, sometimes uh, when businesses do start out they'll have a very wide market net and you'll not you, you won't be able to kind of um add value to all of them so in my instance for example when i was um researching my idea uh, we wanted to provide insights and support small businesses but when you start looking at small businesses there's so many different kinds i mean there's construction small businesses there's transport small businesses um there's e-commerce small businesses and for us, when you start looking at the, the needs and what data they require to make the right decisions, it, it's so different. Um, and I think it's the same for a lot of other businesses. Um, I've been working quite closely with skincare businesses recently, and it's the same. Um, if you look at the whole skincare market, I mean, it's millions of people in the world, or billions of people in the world. But if you try and create a product which applies to everybody, then you'll struggle. Uh, and I think where people do really well is then have multiple personas. Um, but at the same time, understand their niche. Um, and I think you keep, you have, it's, it's one where you have to keep researching and understanding. You might have this overall hypothesis, but you need to find out, okay, who does this problem apply to the most? Um, what segment of the market uh, applies to the most? And that's what I think goes back to what Caitlin was saying, where you need to keep an open mind and keep researching, keep understanding the different personas that you have. And, and first kind of focus on that one persona that actually has your problem the most and is willing to pay for it. Uh, once you've solved that problem for, for them, you can start then moving into other personas and, and solving problems for them as well. I think I, I don't really have, have much to add, but like uh, if I would basically start about like uh, thinking about totally new market or, or like new, new problem that you're basically going to solve, you already spotted it somewhere, right? Because you know that this problem exists, right? So if it was your problem, if it was problem of your friend, of, of your of your mother or whoever you met, I mean, you kind of have your first persona, right? So the, the question that, that I would just like to ask or answer immediately for research is how many people like this are around me? And if I, if I can reach them in any way, if they are not, let's say, too scattered around the world. And I think that's, that's a good starting point. I agree with, with Caitlin as well that sometimes like on mass product or on product that are quite similar in terms of 
current offering. Uh, I don't see it like as a must to clearly define, you know, your 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 kind of personas. If we're talking about transportation, for example, we can say that hey, for us right now in Swivel, we got like okay, there is uh, millions of people in Egypt. All of them are commuting in Cairo. And there will be people that can pay for this between X and Y, and that's the income. And that's how many people we have like this. And that's our target market. And we can define personas that can be commuter or student. But I think primary reason is to answer how many people face the problem that you that you that you're solving. I, I think so. It's a, a fascinating and, and frankly could spend hours and hours talking about them. I also came across this concept recently about anti personas. And I think that's about trying to help you remember who you're not targeting. Um, and it's like, okay, well, this is the characteristic, this is the behavior of people who aren't going to convert or who aren't going to spend money. And so let's keep them in mind too. So we don't inadvertently fall down that, that rabbit hole. Um, okay, so moving on from, from research and um, we've, we've got a clear sense of who we're going after and we're now moving into actually creating our, our MVP, our minimum viable product. Um, how minimum or minimal is minimal? You know, people could spend hours and days and I'm sure it evolves over time, but when you're really creating your very first product, like where do you start? What, what have you seen work well? What, what do you suggest? I can maybe just pick this one for now. So, I mean, we, we speak about like, there is this MVP meet because like it was popularized in, in the literature like a couple of years ago, like everyone speaks about MVP, but many times what people need is either like a proof of concept or prototype or like you don't need to directly like whatever definition we take. The point is that you that you able to to check if your initial hypothesis that you isolated before if it actually if it actually works right. So if you want to feed people with uh, whatever insects, you need to try if people can, for example, or w whatever food, new food, you need to try if people can, can actually eat it or, or if there is any interest in it. That's, that's can be one of, one of, one of hypotheses that you, that you have to check. And in my opinion, MVP, like you're asking how minimal it has to be. I think actually you don't need to build anything. Like there is a very interesting story of the guy who, who founded Robin Hood. And because of regulations, uh, he, there was like a chicken egg dilemma kind of, uh, because he couldn't launch product because he didn't get approval. So, and kind of, you know, he get, need to earn some money to actually, you know, be big enough to get approval. But like what he did before is that he just, I mean, similar what I saw that Sohype is doing right now with his product. He just uh, asked simply how many people are interested in downloading an app like this. And he got around like million of, of people in his, in his uh, newsletter base. So, I mean, the hypothesis of, of demand was answered pretty much. Now he just had to prove that, have a proof of concept that it's actually possible what they, what they wanted to do. But at least he knew that like most risky hypothesis, would people put money in their app to, to invest on the stock exchange or whatever, because we didn't know it before, right? So he answered this even without building, building anything, right? So there is tons of like awesome examples of how people test things even without kind of putting pretty much anything in it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think there's been some quite good cases of very, very minimal MVPs. Um, one common thing, uh, or a new trend is to create like fake buttons where you'll create a landing page with all the information on there, but when they click to buy it, they'll just come up with, thanks for your interest. So it, it's a good way to monitor uh, how many people are interested in signing up for something. Um, there was one company that went for, I think, the recent YC, um, cohort that actually created their MVP on WhatsApp. Um, they were marketplace um, and they might started manually putting kind of the buy and sell side together uh, on, on a WhatsApp group and then went from there. So I, th I think uh, MVP can be minimal, but at the same time, it dep does depend on the industry. If you're looking to start up a bank or something, then the MVP needs to be a little more uh, than a WhatsApp group or a landing page. But at the same time, I think as, as soon as you can start testing how about this, um, but in terms of the proof of concept, which is, I think, what people actually refer to when they mean MVP, 
um, in my opinion, it's something that needs to provide at least one piece of value to the user uh, and something that will bring them back um, or make them ask questions or make them kind of in, interrogate the, um, the product uh, in some way. Um, and a good, I think, success rate for that would be kind of for them to tell you that they want X feature or that feature. Um, it means that they have some engagement with the app uh, and then they want more, um, but you, you certainly don't need to give them all the answers. Um, a lot of people uh, do just <laughs> confuse uh, MVP and they they go for like a maximum viable product and they'll go a little bit a million different features. Um, I think you can start quickly cutting down a lot of features um, just by looking at which ones add value and which, are, which ones are part of your core proposition. Yeah. I, 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 I love all of that. And, and I think also I've heard too about just getting it out there because everybody really gets so concerned about things being perfect. Um, but really you just need data, don't you, to, to validate your hypothesis in the first place and then move on from there. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, so to that uh, comment, um, exactly, to validate your hypothesis, how do you do that? How do you measure your success? For example, if you want to have a new round of um, customer acquisition or if, um, launch a new campaign or a new feature in your app, um, how do you really, after the uh, campaign has launched, how do you really measure the success of it? So it's an interesting question, right? I think everyone will define success differently based on what their goals are, right? If it's profitability, if it's getting new customers, if it's driving sales and ROAS. Um, I always, listen, we all know that one test isn't enough, right? And I think what's really important is that just because you've launched or you've set your one campaign doesn't mean you shouldn't be testing another one, right? It could be as simple as you sent it out on a Tuesday versus a Wednesday, and that made all the difference in what your retention or conversion rates were. Um, so I always, I love testing, obviously I'm a marketer, um, but I can test all day long and not stop and still find different things. And I think the important is, the important thing is kind of what Tori was saying is, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to get out there and people need to see it and need to be able to interact with it. Just like the, the way I'll explain it to my clients is, when you build a house, you set your blueprint and then you get your designer or you do your rooms one by one and then you renovate three years later and you change it and you fix it and you see what works and what doesn't work and what you want to optimize. It's the same with anything online, right? You constantly want to be optimizing. You build your house, but the work's never really done. I like that analogy. If only the house was always perfect and nothing Thanks. needed more. It's one analogy that I've come up with on my own. Usually when I say an analogy, I've totally stolen them from someone else. But that one was actually on mine. Great. It's a, it's a beautiful analogy. So, but uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. And honestly, if you set up something totally from scratch, this, uh, this measurements KPI like might be super challenging. Like at the end it's, up to you like uh, what you're gonna do with it but like if your business plan or whatever model that you assumed you know make think that you need x number of users or you estimate certain interest or you think you can reach i don't know 50,000 people with your app uh, you will know pretty fast like what's the level of this it's gonna give you not gonna give you the exact number but it will give you some some scale right obviously you can move from there Let's say you didn't spend much on online marketing, but you will know if it was one person or just your your parents, or maybe you know uh, one thousand other people, right? So, I think that's that's pretty challenging. Like if you if you work on bigger products, like uh, when you already have some, I'm talking about like the, the startups I'm, I, I worked on. It's it's pretty easy to set up success, right? Because you have perfect tracking. You you already have like millions of users of your product. And then you can define it on 
very clearly what you want to achieve if it's like improvement in your profitability or, or conversion rate and what are what are different uh, decision criteria that you're gonna take after certain results which significance etc etc so but that's i think when you when you build something totally from scratch it's 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 a way more challenging and it will always require some uh, some leap of faith even as, as exactly as caitlin caitlin said I also want to add something quickly too. What I learned very early in my career as like a just a little pro tip, before you start any campaign or launch anything, sit down and ask yourself why. Like, why are you wasting the time doing this? Why are you spending money on this? What is the number one thing you want to get out of it? And do that before you've gone live with anything right? Do that before you've defined your creative, before you've defined your audience, before any of anything has gone live where you could sort of let that skew what your next steps are going to be. But just always ask yourself what your why is. I found that helps a lot. Yeah, and just really quickly on that. Um, yeah, I think a good way to do the why is through the uh, business model canvas. It's quite a good tool to use uh, and that takes you through all different elements and you do ask yourself why in multiple different forms, uh, which really gets helps you get underneath your idea. Um, and just touching on what Caitlin said earlier about kind of your hypothesis testing, there's so many different variables that could play an impact on what your result is. Uh, when you're doing a landing page, you, your copyright, your uh, ad campaign, um, the way you word things, the way kind of uh, your layer is, all, all these things can play an impact on the outcome that you get so whilst necessarily your idea might be sound the way you describe it might not be sound um and it could result to a totally different outcome so i think um in the end i think what lucas said earlier <clears throat> it does come down to you taking a leap of faith and you having enough understanding uh, of what you're doing and um if people will want it and i think a, a good way to do it is maybe talk to you as many users when they when you do get a yes through your website speak to them see why they said yes and just keep drilling down Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, very insightful. Um, now the big, big next part is actually the, the product build itself. So you've done your research, you've, you know, there's a, there's a demand for the product. You want to build it. You've, you've put together the plan of how to do it. And then yes, how do you actually do it? So obviously the big question first, do you build an app or is it going to be more web-based? Um, and then what are the pros and cons of both? Um, what are the numbers of employees you need, the developers? Um, what are the costs? As if you, obviously for every startup, the biggest uh, question in the beginning. Also frequency of updates. Um, I know for example, mobile phone apps, you need to have kind of a different version for each single mobile type out there, um, which obviously uh, from a certain point becomes very expensive. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that, your insights? Uh, your ideas so i would i would just follow like regarding like whatever stack you decide to choose if it's a mobile app or, or a website or whatever should depend on the on the use, use case that you have for your customer i would not be driven by how easy it is to develop like right now in in uh it's pretty easy like basically there is so many tools that allows you to set up websites within within two, three minutes, even e-commerce platform, if your use case. So I would not, in mobile or, or web, it doesn't really matter. I would focus on like what your customers really need in this specific case. What's the point if you, if they're gonna stay with you for a long time, maybe it's a better idea to have a mobile app, etc. But uh, I think there is like so many different tools out there and it's like grew so much over the last 10 years that as long as you don't do something that is very specific, you're basically able to set it up from scratch in 10 minutes, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think um, your first attempt should be to try, try and do as much as you can yourself. Um, and there's so many tools out there, be it Bubble, WordPress, Shopify, that you can do a lot really quickly um, by yourself. Uh, and then when it gets too much for yourself, and that's I think when you start looking at Kind of external um, individuals to help you. Um, one thing I found is if you've done things correctly by then you should have a very clear uh, mission and vision of what you're trying to achieve. Um, 
and the best way to kind of get people on board um, and to get them to give you kind of discount or and not charge you as much as they normally would uh, is by trying to kind of get them to buy into your vision. Um, I, I've met some, some really talented developers who were willing to kind of work a half price um, just because they believe in the vision and the mission of what we're doing. So I think that's important to kind of try and sell them on what you're trying to do um, and then kind of go, go from there. I, I, I love that. I think um, you're touching upon an interesting piece there as well, like you say, about just the importance of storytelling and the ability to really clearly communicate what you're trying to do, which not only is important when you're trying to build a product, but then, of course, when you're trying to market that and, and get that um, message across to all of your users as well uh, and, and helping them understand what your product's all about. Um, thank you. I'm curious just generally um does that differ at all when it comes to like compliancy are there certain areas where people would be advised to use more off-the-shelf products um versus trying to build them themselves and this could be products for marketing just as much as for the actual product itself um, does that ever come into play I think it depends if if, uh, if you're like your your core business is a tech business like let's say clubhouse or that was mentioned here like it's a tech business they create something totally new and that's the only value they have if you have a physical product i mean e-commerce is nothing new right and the way you're gonna sell it like it doesn't bring any value to you so you don't need to focus on this this problem was already solved by uh, Jeff Bezos quite some time ago so I mean whatever platform you, you have right uh, it's just gonna work for you because you your core business are the products you're selling in this case but if you I think if you're really focusing on tech on experience you're building something new then you need to start to building it on, on your own right Yeah, um, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think you also have to look at what's your, your core value proposition uh, in terms of the platform that you have. Um, for us, for example, um, with data being integral to what we're doing, we did have off the shelf data solutions available. Um, they were quite expensive, um, but this, but the, the main reason we didn't go for them was the level of control that we needed over our own platform and the delivery of what we're doing. Um, so it was kind of, better for us to create something in-house uh, that's more robust and we have more control um, because ultimately although for MVP it's okay to be it's okay to cut corners to an extent um, but what you don't want is for you to spend a lot of money on an MVP um, and then know you're going to scrap something later um, so I think it, it's if you can do things in the right way from the beginning um, but at the same time, if, if, you, if you do have a more simpler business model, then there's so many tools out there, be it WordPress, Bubble, Shopify, that you can use and you can create things on top of. And there's so many large businesses that are created on top of those platforms as well. So uh, I think it's, it's always good to explore as many solutions as possible. I know that our first MVP that we did um, was a, like a very basic product that we used uh, Google Data Studio for. So um, there's, there's lots of different solutions that you can use uh, that would help you get to your first point. I, I deal mostly with a physical, tangible good. And I really love this question because knowing that it's 2021, almost everyone approaches their business with a global mindset and how they're going to target people everywhere in the world, right? Um, and it's not only important to take into account the actual like compliance regulations in each country or in each state, right? The way Americans approach healthcare is different than the rest of the world, unfortunately. Um, but it's understanding that here in the States, something is selling a, a pair of prescription eyewear online is a lot different than selling it abroad and what the limitations and how that just defines kind of your tech stack. Um, and more importantly too, I think it's also understanding the cultural challenges and, and differences as well, right? Americans, we use credit cards like it's, free in the in South Korea you wouldn't want to have a strategy around credit and how that differs um, and it kind of helps define once you understand the markets you're going after and I say that 
high level as just the countries, it can help define what kind of your compliance tech stack will look like. Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys. <laughs> Do you want to take over the story? Um, I, I was just going to say, everybody, um, we've been just firing questions at, uh, at our, our fantastic speakers here. So if you do have a burning question, um, post it in the chat now. Otherwise, we're just going to keep asking all of our favorite ones. Um, there's one more um, that I, I'll ask just around um, pivots, and then I'll, I'll hand it back to, to all if we haven't got any other questions, um, which is, when do you... When do you know that you need to pivot or when should you pivot? Um, and I guess I'm, I'm thinking about this, you know, so you could be considering a new business model entirely. You could be thinking about a new product line. You could be thinking about a new customer. When do you start, I guess, moving on from just data insights being interesting to them becoming a trend? At what point do you say, okay, now's the time that we need to make a change? Um, I can quick take this one. Um, so we've had a few mini pivots. Um, I don't, I don't know really how to answer this, but apart from saying like when it makes sense, um, when you've got two options, um, your old idea and your new idea, and the new one makes a bit more sense than what you're previously doing, then I think at that point you pivot. So I think initially when we we're looking at launching and facts, um, I had this idea of maybe having a manual consultancy type of thing where you, where the back end was powered by AI. Um, but then when I got, when I started speaking to people um, and they said, you having amazing technology on the back end and then providing reports to the user is nothing amazing. Um, you, what you're creating, the value is lost. And I think we very quickly on quickly pivoted to having a platform which the user can interrogate themselves. So I guess um, you, you'll have multiple pivots in terms of even at MVP stage or by the time you launch. But um, I don't think it, it normally will make sense to you which one uh, is best. And if it doesn't make sense, I guess that's where you still have an hypothesis and you'll keep testing it, keep speaking to users uh, and figure out which one works best for a user um, and what, what the challenges are in that particular pivot not working um, and until you fully understand uh, what, what the opportunity is uh, when you could do pivot um, and, and use that opportunity for your business. I like what you said just there. It's like when the, the new idea looks better than the, the current one. I don't know that it gets more straightforward than that. It's just when the grass is, you know, genuinely greener as opposed to just optically, um, you might think it's better. Uh, fantastic. Okay, oh no, uh, back over to you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> So um, as we're still waiting for some questions from the um, participants, um, we're going to enter now the quick fire round, which is basically I'm going to ask a question. We have three questions lined up um, and you guys just going to give your quick thoughts um, and just shoot them straight out. Um, yeah, just to give a little overview about uh, some topics here. Um, so question one would be, about the tools that you use to prototype, to create your MVP, and also to find your target audience, which would be the ones that you suggest? Um, obviously, always con uh, keeping in mind that there's differences with B2C and B2B. Um, yeah, fire away. <laughs> um, a platform that I think I I've used for like a good, good 10 years now, uh, and I keep coming back to is WordPress. Um, for MVP stage, for early kind of testing, it's so good. You've got so many templates out there uh, through like Theme Forest that you can create anything from a sim simple website. I know someone who's creating a fintech uh, MVP using WordPress, so uh, yeah, I think it's really versatile. And I think possibly the new one, uh, Webflow, something like that right now could work really well as well. But I think WordPress, given how long I've used it, uh, is one of my favorites to create any or test any idea. That was going to be mine, Word uh, Webflow. Um, I use Shopify nine out of 10 times for anything e-com related. Um, I prefer to use Shopify, um, but I've recently started working with Webflow a lot more because it's just so easy. And for people who don't know what Webflow is, can you explain? It 
To be honest, I actually don't know enough about the company. <laughs> I know it's a platform that was designed to take the dev work out of platform design. Specifically, um, four thing. I just actually referred a fintech customer to Webflow for this. If it's a non-transactional item and more of like an educational type of site, um, it's really good. You can it, the concept is kind of anyone can create a website, and you don't need to be a developer to have a really robust functionality. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's something so like WordPress and uh, Wix as well is an awesome tool. Like uh, Wix is pretty much the same thing. You can set up like in five minutes uh, any like a forum or, or website or whatever you want to uh, choose the template. It's going to be there super quickly. So like that's for websites, like that's for standard templates. The same Shopify could be very good for e-commerce, super standardized templates, like very quick. If you guys want to be like more creative and you really want to design something on your own, let's say on mobile device, I think Figma or or or, uh, or Maze are super interesting. So what, what Maze does is basically you can put a couple of screens that you designed all together and then see the paths of users who actually interact with it. So you can kind of do the some tests and it shows you the heat maps of how people clicked on certain things. I don't think like I just want to like show some other tools as well versus the one that I mentioned. I don't think it's very necessary on on the early stage, but once you improve your product, it's super critical because you really see how people approach. You really validate if what you think they would understood as component, they would really click on it and what they do with it. So that's super, super kind of valuable and you can set it up pretty quickly. Great, thank you guys, super interesting. And um, just towards the audience, um, we're gonna put all the names of the apps. Um, we're gonna uh, send a little follow-up email and then we got to put all the products. So no reason to Google like crazy. Right now, uh, keep listening. <laughs> um, great, the next question would be, how do you prioritize um, be that products or features, campaigns? Um, again, obviously it's gonna be very different between B2B to, and B2C, I guess. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Um, um, so I think that's, that's something that we have to go through. We had tons of ideas and tons of different data sources and insights that we wanted to provide to our users. Um, and I think in the testing, when you are going through uh, these ideas with the, with the user, um, there'll be some things that they'll really kind of, their eyes will light up on. And I guess those are things that you will prioritize on. Um, so I know we were, when we were going through things and explaining different features, um, most of the answer, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. And then there'll be one, oh, oh really, you can give me that. Uh, and then suddenly, okay, you know, okay, that's the one that you need to be focusing on. So our, our whole MVP now is actually focusing on, there was one particular feature um, that users kept talking about um, that, uh, and our whole MVP is kind of focusing on that and all the other features are now kind of later down on the roadmap. So I think when you speak to users, um, they'll subconsciously, maybe if it, it's not even kind of um, them saying it's amazing, but if they're interested in asking you follow-up questions about that, it, it kind of shows that they may be interested in that. And that's the one that you should be focusing on. So speak to users uh, and get feedback from them. I typically, my work as it pertains to just MVPs in general, is around initial website builds, right? And I think going back to what the why is, it's how fast do you want it? How much money do you want to spend? Which will help inform a lot of the features. Everyone wants a website with all of the bells and whistles, um, but sometimes you have a beer budget on your champagne dreams. So it really all depends on, on what it can be. Um, I have sort of like a standard tech stack that I'll typically use with my clients and then build or take things out based on, hey, we need a website in a month versus we need a website in six months. Um, a lot of it for in my world specifically comes around like time limitations.
Yeah, I agree. I just want to add like that there is like a lot of frameworks that you can find in uh, product management when you basically compare effort to, to impact to what's how confident you are uh, regarding this impact. There's a lot of things, but like the, the one question that, that is very good to, to answer, because obviously you won't be able in many cases to bring it to, to one KPI that you can easily compare between each other. It's to ask question like, what will happen if I'm not going to build it, right? Let's say you might end up like with uh, building, I don't know, for new market that you think gonna bring you 50% of increase in, in revenue. But you might also, on the other hand, think of improving your, I don't know, payment security. And it doesn't bring you any value in terms of finance. But if one customer reports that their credit detail got stolen, like uh, your your business might, the image of your, of your company might be destroyed forever, right? So, I mean, it's a very hard choice, but like the question that we usually ask is, what happens if I, if I don't build this? And that's the ultimate validation. And I think it's kind of follows up as well on the Brandon question. I just I just saw it on the chat. Uh, how can how much can you deviate from uh, from your vision? Like when you build MV, when you work on MVP, and I would say like as much as it's not gonna destroy like your retention or or, or in any way your reliability. Because like all is fine if you say, okay, you just gauged interest and we're going to come back with this product in, in three months. That's fine. People understand it. But if you start to sell something that people will remember super bad, if you're e-commerce company and you're MVPing something and you're not going to deliver products in a timely manner, that's like not a good start. So on, you should not compromise on, on experience, on, on your promise to customer, even during in MVP stage. And just adding on from what Lucas said, I think it might be slightly um, uh, an unpopular opinion. Uh, a lot of people say they should cut corner on this, but I, I think uh, UI is something, and uh, UX is something that you shouldn't cut corners on because people are surrounded with these slick apps. Uh, look, if you look at any banking app or if you look at kind of your uh, WhatsApp and Instagram, they're really slick, they're really smooth. And then if you create an MVP, which is really basic and it looks ugly, um, you, you might be doing something, but that ugliness will actually drive some users away uh, and they, they won't be willing to use it. So I think um, having a good user experience uh, and good graphic design is something that you should focus on. Don't go all in and spend like tens of thousands. Uh, but definitely pay some attention to it and, and buy some templates from online. There's a, there's a lot of stuff you can do um, that you can buy off the shelf to help you with that. But I think UI is quite important because I think first impressions count. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, we have one last point left in the quick fire round, but I saw that there's a question from Brandon. Oh, and um, Brandon's yeah. question just got answered. Was it so fully answered? I think, I, I think so. Okay. <laughs> Good. Then we skip that one. But then um, I will still be uh, asked the last one for the quick fire round. Um, and this would be, again, what I mentioned before, that there's always a big difference between B2B and B2C um, launches. And what are your general ideas and um, approaches on this difference? Um, if you want to launch a B2B um, firm, the MVP is obviously going to look very different uh, to the B2C. Um, yeah, G any general ideas on the differences on this? I think Lucas just nailed it from a B2C point, right? I mean, if you're, if you're promising a product and you can't deliver on that promise, specifically for a B2C standpoint, those are customers that you will very likely never be able to get back. Um, and that's a huge sort of, it's a barrier for a lot of B2C firms, right? Is that they need to have their operations sorted through. They need to have their warehousing and all of their facilities ready to go um, from a B2C standpoint. I, To be honest, I don't work a lot with B2B, so I can't really talk about that. Um, but specifically in B2C, I think a lot of the failures, there was a brand here in the States called Sporty and Rich that early on in the pandemic, she was torn apart in the US on Instagram and kind of destroyed her brand 
in a big way because she just couldn't deliver on her her proposition. And it was really, really challenging for her and her brand really suffered from it. So that's sort of my tidbit, I guess. Yeah, um, and just coming on, on B2B, I guess B2B is a bit different because that B can differ um, so much. So you, your B could be one man person, which is very similar to B2C, but then at the same time, it could be a 10,000 person corporation, which is entirely different. So um, I think, yeah, you need to understand kind of where in that spectrum of B2B you are, um, and then you need to adjust what you do accordingly. Because, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone fit one size fits all um answer for that one uh, if you're doing some enterprise it's going to be totally totally different um and your sales journey um and your product will be entirely different it, it might take you nine to twelve months to land one customer whereas in a btc uh, you, you might be expecting to do thousands of customers in that time yeah i would i would like following up on one so have said i would say it does not really depends if it's b2c or or, uh, or b2b it really depends on what is the size of the what is the kind of size of the ticket for for your for your company because like when it comes to prioritization like we have some big clients in the middle list and we basically build the products for them because we know that it's going to be ultimately maybe 10% of our entire revenue so they basically tells us what to build and signing this contract for five years basically might determine our like product strategy going forward. So in this case, you can kind of try to meet your customer requirements, uh, client requirements, and like it's, it's pretty straightforward. So you don't really need to build for, for persona because that's that you kind of spot, but you actually have this one person or one enterprise in front of you that tells you everything and that's your market. Great, uh, thank you guys. Um, we just got another question in uh, from Ishik. Um, do you have any suggestions for how to deal with data complexity? Um, since the business can collect a large amount of data nowadays uh, with different tools, um, how do you best manage this? Do you have uh, any examples like ISIC or like what kind of problem does it raise? Uh, ISIC, if you want to talk, otherwise you can also unmute your microphone. Maybe it's easier in terms of. Okay, she's uh, texted. Google Analytics uh, could be one, for example. Um, I, I guess it comes back down to kind of your, how it's been set up. I think uh, Google An Analytics can can collect a lot of data, but if, you've, if it's been set up in the right way, you have your goal set up in the right way, um, then that data starts telling a story. Because um, otherwise you'll see so many people click on home pages and clicking on that page. Um, but if you've got your goals and I guess it's, it's that journey that you need to understand and what, what actions you want the user to take. So um, if you are expecting to kind of collect a lot of data, I guess you need to set it up in the right way. So when it starts flowing through, it, it starts helping you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we got one other question uh, from Godwin. Um, Building a product that your audience uh, needs is one thing, but in the digital world, we have a dependency on Google and other social platforms uh, to market the product. From uh, my experience, it is extremely challenging to rely on Google uh, to show your products on page one or two. So if your business is an e-commerce uh, business, how do you ensure that your target and your audience um, are reached out in the right scale? And uh, when Google fails you, what is your plan B? Um, I could take this. Godwin, also, we can take this offline if this ends, because I could literally spend eight hours straight talking about this. <laughs> um, so feel free to email me or LinkedIn, whatever. Um, it's, I, I talk to so many people who come to me and say, hey, help me grow my business. I have $500 and I want to spend it on Google and I want to be the next Glossier or away. Well, I think 
taking a step back to how a lot of these digital darling companies evolved was because they had a lot of money that they invested in platforms like Google, in Facebook, in the social media like space, right? So I think a lot of times founders will underestimate how much these things cost in order to get to where you need to be. It's, I, I personally say to all of my clients, until you're ready to spend at mm -hmm. least 15,000 a month, don't invest in Google because you won't be successful. And you're not going to get on the search pages in one, in two. And this is all dependent upon your category. Keep in mind, I work in fashion and apparel most of the time. Um, but, I, you know, if Google, fa it's kind of a two-part question, right? Like, if Google fails you, well, it shouldn't, in theory, right? You're probably either not spending enough or not using the right agency or not using the right person. There's a lot of people out there who claim to grow businesses online. And I always say if any one person knew how to do it perfectly, they would not be selling themselves on Instagram. But um, I... I think you need to re there's millions of different ways. And I, I don't know, Godwin, maybe if you could share like what industry specifically, but there's a million different platforms and how to grow and cast a wide net without it being necessarily Google or Facebook based on your industry. Yeah. There's no specific industry. So I've done pricing comparison website like 15 years back or 19 years back. So I tried a couple of things. I think for a brief moment, you're successful your business is going well and then Google suddenly kind of throws your page in some, somewhere else. I mean, yeah, so if you're spending on ad, AdWord or other things, you probably have a better chance of success, right? But if you're hoping that uh, Google is going to rank your page in the first or second page, then I, I believe your chance of success is, you know, very less. Yeah, it's... You, there's a couple things there. So a lot of people will spend money in Google and then see themselves start appearing. And then they're like, oh, we can scale back or we can drive more efficient ads. And then they start seeing areas where they're not doing so well. And it's sort of this never ending hill that they have to reclimb, if you will. Um, it, it's, it's challenging, right? Google, Facebook, they're out to take your money and they don't care how well you do as a business. So unless you're spending money and spending it consistently and spending more year over year, they quite frankly don't care about you. And they'll say that that doesn't impact your business, but it's it does. Um, I, I, we could kind of take this offline because like I said, I could talk about this forever. Um, but if you want, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like I'll let say, someone else talk. <laughs> let's agree there are crooks, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, and it's just a start because when you scale your company, you will also have uh, need cloud services from <laughs> AWS, Amazon. If you work in a uh, transportation space, you will need uh, mapping APIs from Google. Like that's, that's, that's just the beginning. So uh, I think it's good to try to play the game that you that you can play, like to be creative maybe. Like you mentioned very mass market, like Caitlin, I don't know if you agree, but like price comparator for mass product is something that it's super hard to niche target, right? So I don't know what would be the alternative, like it, how can you- It's a saturated market now. So I'm not thinking about price comparison, uh, comparison site today, but I think uh, uh, fifth, more than 15 years back, I started it. Uh, I think for a brief moment, I think it was uh, reasonably, it was doing well. And then, yeah, everything went uh, down the hill. <laughs> so because, because if you don't get the audience, you don't have a business, right? So the, the, the concept of the business is uh, the more audience you get, the more, revenue your website makes so yeah I, not to be the american who thinks these companies are ridiculous anyway but um and yeah tori we could literally talk about this forever and brandon i agree um but even think 10 15 years ago where the market was right and i not necessarily a price comparison or like a a, a mass market type thing but my strategy at Guilt Group, which was a massive discounted retailer here in the States, was significantly different based on the way Google and Facebook functionality worked back then. 
right? It was just a very, very different strategy. And I think so much changes so quickly. And the reality is you need a lot of money to be able to support it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think another thing, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it's a really quick point. I think the other thing that you should try and do is Google uh, or Instagram or whichever social media platform should only be a, a originator for you. Uh, and you should try and take ownership of that customer as soon as possible. So don't rely on Google to keep feeding you that customer every time. Um, you should need to kind of, um, yeah, bring that customer into your own ecosystem. Um, so that the next time around when they come to you, um, they know where to find you or they come directly or you have an email address or some contact with them that you can kind of keep up, keep going back to that user. Um, I think that that's quite important because um, as kind of Caitlin mentioned, Google will keep changing algorithms and they'll do that every month. Um, so um, yeah, you, you need to keep constantly spending money or keep updating your content to ensure that your page one on Google Absolutely. Like knowing your persona should help, right? Because you can reach certain segments for free in different places. So like uh, if it's product for software developers, you should probably know where you can find them. And you can just start like in the certain manner that doesn't cost you anything. Perfect. Thank you. Very useful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, so if there are no more questions um, from the group, then we come to the important part of how could people reach you, uh, our dear panelists. Um, Kathleen, you mentioned earlier already that people can reach out to you on LinkedIn. Um, are there any other sources how people can reach out to you? Do you want me to share like my email and site here and stuff? Yes, I can. Um, we can we, we can do that, but also otherwise um, we can also add all your details in the email and the follow up email. Oh uh, yeah, I you can. Get, uh, this is an extension of my arm. Literally, take my number, take my email, take my address. I accept all forms of communication. I'll um I'll put my email in the chat and everything else. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, LinkedIn or email is fine. I can put my email in into the chat as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Same, guys. If you think that I can be helpful with anything, just email LinkedIn is totally fine. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, our speakers. And uh, thank you, everyone else as well. Um, I think it was a very, very good session. Super insightful, especially on the uh, development of the different tools and of how to actually size and approach your market. Um, yeah, so with that, we will close this session. Again, big, big thank you to the speakers and all of our audience. And um, yeah, we will probably see us all again on the next meeting that we probably have in mid-May. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you guys thank you. so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, bye.